Welcome to the video where we will be discussing introducing three-dimensional vectors. We're going to get started, however, by taking a look again at two-dimensional vectors and defining them using angles from both axes, both the x and y axes. So let's say I have some vector v and it is in the two-dimensional space defined by the x and y axes. And that vector is at an angle alpha from the x-axis, so that's here, and beta from the y-axis. And I would like to write v, that vector, in terms of its magnitude and alpha and beta. So what I'm going to be doing is determining Vx in Vy, which I've shown here in purple. So I'm going to find the magnitude of this line, its x component, and its y component. So I can do that by determining Vx is equal to the magnitude times the cosine of alpha, and Vy is the magnitude of the vector times the cosine of beta. And I can write this in Cartesian vector form by saying that the vector v is equal to the magnitude times cosine alpha times i plus the magnitude times the cosine beta times j. I think you would all agree with me that this two-dimensional vector actually has a third dimension, right? So we live in a three-dimensional world, so we often like to simplify problems by doing them only in two dimensions, but there really is a third dimension. And that third dimension I've just drawn is Z, and it's coming straight at you out of the board. So the Z direction, we're going to call it positive, coming out of the board. And so the vector v acts 90 degrees from this z-axis going straight in. So our, we're going to call that angle gamma, and it's equal to 90 degrees, and so we could find the z component of this vector, but it ends up being zero because the cosine of 90 is zero. However, if I rotate that vector v away from our two-dimensional space, then the angle is no longer 90 degrees, and Vz will not be equal to zero. That should say that gamma is not 90 degrees, and our, our vector in the z direction will no longer be equal to zero. So because we live in a three-dimensional world and many of our engineering problems are three-dimensional, we're going to have to solve a lot of problems in three dimensions. So the rest of this video kind of introduces the three-dimensional world and how to get your brain to think in three dimensions. The first thing we need to do whenever we work in three dimensions is set up a coordinate system. All right, so we need to pick an x, y, and a z direction. And there is a correct way to pick your positive coordinate system, and it's by using the right-hand rule. So I could draw my positive x, y, and z axes. So let's label those x, y, and z. And how do I know if I've correctly identified the positive x, y, and z direction? I'm going to use my right hand and the fingers from my right hand should align with positive x, y, and z directions. So when we do this, the positive x is going to be your thumb, the positive y will be your index, and the positive z will be your middle finger. So that could be a little confusing, so I've provided here a couple of different pictures to show this. So here's one example of a hand showing you the positive x, y, and z using the right hand. So again, the x, positive x is the thumb, 
positive y is the index, and positive z is the middle finger. However, here's two more examples. So you're going to come across different problems from different sources from your textbook. Maybe you see an example online. So don't get caught up in the x, y, and z always looking like this particular case. Both of these other two examples that I've provided here are also follow the right hand rule. So in this one, x is again the thumb, so it's going straight up, and then the y is coming out at you, and, and then the z goes along the middle finger. So this works in both, in all three of these cases, the right hand rule is conserved. So we're going to kind of bring both of those concepts together and work through an example here where we define 3D vectors using angles and the magnitude of the vector. So here is my coordinate system, positives x, y, and z. And I have a vector here, v1, and it has a magnitude of 10 newtons, and I define it using three dimensions three angles from the x, the y, and the z axes. And so gamma, sorry, alpha, the angle from the x axes, is equal to 70 degrees. Beta, the angle from the y axes, is 85 degrees. And then gamma is equal to 20 degrees, and that is the angle from the z axes. And so we would like to write that vector v in Cartesian vector form. So that's going to have an x, a y, and a z component. So v1 is going to be equal to the magnitude of v1 times the cosine of alpha 1 times i plus the magnitude of v1 times the cosine of beta 1 times j plus that magnitude times the cosine of gamma 1 times k. So plugging in what we know, we have 10 newtons times the cosine of 70 degrees times i plus 10 newtons times the cosine of 85 degrees times j plus 10 newtons times the cosine of 20 degrees times k. So plugging this into our calculator, we're going to get that V1 is 3.42i plus 0.87j plus 9.40k newtons. So we're going to extend this a little bit further and look at a second vector. So we're going to define vector 2, V2, using its Cartesian vector form, and it's going to be equal to 13.4i plus 17.32j plus 9.40k newtons. And we would like to, from this Cartesian vector form, determine the magnitude of V2 and the angle it makes from each of the axes. So we're going to determine alpha 2, beta 2, and gamma 2. So if you look back up here at my figure, I'm going to go ahead and try to draw in this V2. In three dimensions, it's a little more difficult to draw the vectors, especially on my iPad. So let's see what we can do. So here would be V x, v2x, so that should have a magnitude of about, sorry, that, okay, sorry, let's go back a little bit. Here we go. The first line I draw there, I just drew that x, the line in the x direction here, okay, see that purple line show up? So that has a magnitude of 13.42. Then I go up in the y direction, 17.32, so here we go, 17.32, and then I'm going to come out towards myself in the z direction with a magnitude of 9.40. And so there we have our second vector, just drew it in purple, v2. 
So to find the magnitude, this is an extension of geometry, we're going to take the square root of each of the components squared. So it's going to be 13.4 squared plus 17.32 squared plus 9.40 squared. Take the square root of that and we're going to get 23.8 newtons. And then we're going to find the directions and so to find the angle that this vector makes with the x-axis, I'm going to take the x component, the i component, and divide it by the magnitude, and that will be equal to the cosine of the angle. So if I find then the inverse angle, the inverse of that, then we'll find the angle. So alpha 2 ends up being 55.7 degrees. So I'm going to do the same and find cosine beta 2 equal to 17.32 divided by the magnitude 23.8 and I'll get a beta 2 of 43.3 degrees and then the cosine of gamma 2 is equal to 17.32 divided by 23.8 so this gives us an angle of 66.7 degrees. So I've gone both ways. I've started with V1. I started with the magnitude and its direction and was able to find the i, j, and k components of that vector. So write the vector in Cartesian vector form. And then going the reverse direction, starting with the Cartesian vector form, you can find the magnitude and those three position uh, directions from each of the axes. So one further extension is we would like to be able to determine unit vectors in three dimensions. So I'm going to go through the theory here and we'll practice it in class the next time we meet in determining 3D unit vectors. So we're going to call our unit vector E and it's equal to the vector V divided by its magnitude. So we can rewrite this in Cartesian vector form as Vxi plus Vy times j plus Vc times k divided by its magnitude. So if I sort of parse this out, I'm going to have Vx divided by its magnitude times i plus Vy divided by its magnitude times j plus Vz divided by its magnitude times k. And what you may notice here is that Vx divided by the magnitude is equal to the cosine of the angle that the vector makes with the x-axis. So if I come back real quick over to the left side of the board, I found the angle that it made with the x-axis by taking the x component here, the x component, so that's the i component, divided by its magnitude. Okay, so I do the same thing, moving back over to the right side, when I find the unit vector. So this defines the x portion of the unit vector and also if I take away that i, so the um, part that's not the i, so the vx over the v is also the cosine of the angle. So the unit vector can be determined if I only know the directions. And this should be a little bit intuitive because we know that a unit vector helps us to define the direction. So if we only know the direction, we can find the unit vector. So we know that the unit vector has a magnitude of 1, and so you can actually deduce this very helpful uh, relation that the cosine squared of alpha plus the cosine squared of beta plus the cosine squared of gamma is equal to 1. So it looks like I made a mistake here in this first the one right here should be alpha, not gamma. And then I'm just going to write up here one more time a reminder for you about unit vectors that are going to it's going to be very handy as we move into three dimensions. So remember, a unit vector defines the direction for all vectors that act in that same direction. Okay, so a unit vector defines the direction for all vectors 
acting in the same direction as the unit vector. That's going to come in really useful as we move into three dimensions. All right, so the next time that you meet in class, we will be working with three-dimensional vectors and trying them out um, and trying to visualize them and working with position vectors and force vectors in three dimensions. So we'll see you in class.